Welcome to the third lecture in the Generalized Linear Models uh, lecture. And in this case, we're going to extend it into what is called generalized estimated equations. So here we're going to take the idea of the generalized linear model, and we're going to extend it to a multivariate uh, sense. So here we're going to think of T outcomes. So not just Y equal to blood pressure, perhaps, but perhaps repeated measures. I have got five observations of blood pressure over the next week. Or perhaps it is multivariate in the sense of I have uh, the answer to six questions. I give each person a battery of questions and they answer the six questions. So T would equal to six in that case. So we're looking at how to deal with the multivariate sense. And this is extremely helpful because where the, the typical linear models work out well for continuous variables that can be properly specified, and we can use um, least squares, generalized linear models, uh, or the, the generalized least squares approach to evaluating sets of uh, multivariate sets of uh, continuous variables, the generalizing, generalized estimated equations allows us to extend that into uh, numerous other types of variables, whether it's count variables or dichotomous variables. We can use the logistic regression, and we now um, evaluate it as uh, a panel across time periods or as a, uh, you know, a set of yes-no answers. Uh, the GEE has really allowed us to deal with uh, the multivariate sense beyond the, the usual simple continuous variables that we had before been able to use with our generalized linear a generalized linear uh, least squares approach. So we're going to think of T outcomes. We're going to think of beta being a P by one vector of parameters. Our estimated equations are really the same as a generalized linear model, only now we just have to extend it into a matrix form. So here we have the derivative of the mean with respect to beta is going to be a t by p derivative. Okay, uh, And this is because there's a mean for each t. I should actually put a little tra transpose right there as well. Indicate that it, the, the rows correspond to the uh, column vector of mu, and the uh, columns here correspond to the transpose of this column vector beta. So it's, it's a t by p. The uh, variance matrix and its inverse is a t by t. Right? It's the variance covariance essentially associated with the t outcomes. yi is a t by 1. mu i is a t by 1. And here we're all talking within the summation, so it's all about the one any given um, uh, observation. So if we take the uh, transpose of this t by p and multiply it by a t by t, and we multiply, uh, take the differences of this, we've got a t by 1, a p by t times a t by 1 times a t by 1, and it gives you a p by 1, which is the outcome as would be expected because we are estimating a p by 1 vector of parameters. So just to show that matrix-wise, we've got it specified in a way that's consistent with the matrix algebra. Uh, this is essentially our estimated equation right here. And it's pretty much the same right, as what we had before. The only real key is really going to be how do we deal with this in a way that can help us understand the variance covariance across the t outcomes. Well, we can let this variance across the outcomes be a specification as follows. We can let phi be a scale type parameter, singular. We can let a matrix A essentially be the diagonal um, with a rescaled variance of all the y's. Right, so, or you can think of it this way, that the phi times A is the diagonal matrix um, of the variances of the y's, where phi is a scalar and this is a matrix. And 
R is our correlation matrix. So you take the correlation matrix and multiply it by this diagonal matrix, and you will get the, uh, the variance covariance matrix. The reason for doing it this way is that it allows us great freedom in specifying the correlation matrix a bit a bit separately uh, than identifying the uh, variance functions. Now, the estimate is going to be consistent even if this V matrix is incorrect, right? Well, because it's positive definite. And remember the results of the generalized method of moments, which we showed that this is, is part of that. And we can use the robust that sandwich estimator for a, a uh, uh, appropriate uh, variance estimator. And the asymptotic normality we can use to, as a basis for our test as long as the sample size is large enough. So the real question now that, that's, that's an extension of GLM into the GEE is really revolving around how do we um, specify the correlation matrix that's going to allow us to um, account for different, uh, different dependencies across the um, observations. Noting that one way to think of it is that since it can be incorrect, we can, it can be any positive definite matrix that we plug in, that we can just put identity matrix if we wanted to, and we'd still get consistent estimates, and we could get robust, proper variances for those consistent estimates. It's just that it won't be very efficient. It's much better to get a properly specified correlation matrix. So one specification would could be just that, identity matrix, and that would be fine. In fact, when you work your way into um, specifying these. Sometimes that is a, a good way to start to just get consistent estimates of the parameters themselves, which you can use to generate residuals and such. Well, another one is an exchangeable matrix, and that means that the variance, the covariances, or the correlations rather, the um, correlations are all the same. So all the off-diagonal elements are all the same, just alpha. This might be the case if you're, again, thinking of giving somebody a battery of questions. Uh, so it's, there's no real time sequence. It's just a random battery of questions, the order of which are just randomly assigned. And it might be reasonable to assume that the correlation and the outcomes are all the same across each of those possible randomly generated um, orderings of the questions. can have a stationary autoregressive co-matrix, a, a correlation matrix. And this would simply be a single coefficient alpha, but that parameter just gets further and further squared, cubed, um, et cetera. And in fact, each element at any row T and column S is going to be simply alpha to the absolute value of the difference between T and S. Can you think of this? as um, really just being useful usually when there's some sort of an ordering to the random variables. And typically this is tied to time series or panel data indexed by time. So if there's a, a, a kind of equal intervals across the time at which they're being observed, then it might be reasonable to assume that the correlation goes down in some exponential form the further back in time you get. Observation one with respect to observation of period. So my, my response now correlated with last week is alpha, correlated with two weeks ago is alpha squared, correlated with three weeks ago is alpha cubed. And if you go to the second row, this would just be an alpha here. And then the next one would be alpha squared, so that we would have last week with respect to two weeks ago is just alpha, and then with respect to three weeks ago would be alpha squared. So that's a, a one way to do it. Another autoregressive non-stationary uh, will set it at a alpha TS if the differences, so you're going to allow uh, the correlation to um, be a particular, you know, different values across different time periods between them, intervals, if it's less than a certain amount, four weeks. After four weeks, it's zero. So you're specifying a point at which there is no longer a correlation. And then there is a completely unstructured 
uh, one, which just simply allows all of the, the whole matrix, ones, ones, all the way down, just to be completely different. An alpha one, an alpha two, an alpha three, an alpha four, an alpha five, just simply completely unstructured. Clearly this one has the most parameters in it because now you have to do a parameter for each correlation. This one up here has the least parameters, except of course the identity matrix, which has no parameters, uh, has the least parameters because it's just one, just alpha. This one also has, similarly, just has an alpha. It just changes it from being constant to exponentiated. So these two kind of compete in that sense. This one, however, has uh, more parameters up to a certain time interval or difference in times of, of uh, g, just whatever you want to call it. Uh, and this one is completely unstructured. And we said that you, as long as it's a positive definite matrix, you actually could specify your own correlation matrix according to however the uh, um, data generating process seems to be most prudently modeled. But these are some very common ones. So our basic form is to say that we have n observations. We have uh, repeated measures, you can think of it, or a number of measures on the observation. And there's a number of parameters in our kind of x beta component. So again, we have a, I'm going to expand it behind, beyond just simply what I had above to include our x's. We take the x's transpose now because we're going across uh, p different parameters. Uh, we have a diagonalized matrix of the derivative of mu with respect to eta. We have our variance, this should be more of a smooth V, our, our um, function of mu that's part of the variance inverse the yi minus mu, and then divided by that scale component. We just took it from the variance over here and stuck it over here. And if we work that all out, we'll then again find that we've got a p by 1 matrix. The key is that this d up here is a diagonal matrix created from the vector of d mu d eta. Right. So even though there's p parameters, eta is at the linear combination of the p, so it's a single component. So there's uh, t, um, t components in mu, and if you take this vector, each of those components in mu with respect to the x beta, the, the eta, and put it along a diagonal, so d is going to be you know, a bunch of derivatives on the diagonal and zeros outside. So these are derivatives with respect to eta all along the bottom, and zeros on the outside. That's what I mean by creating diagonal matrix. So then our um, function here is going to be expressed as the diagonalization of uh, this function squared. Correlation and the thing again with our not square, uh, uh, square root to create our variance matrix. So again, we're going to be looking at solving these equations here. Okay. But we're going to re express again the variance as, as a function of a correlation matrix, which you then specify. Again, is this correlation matrix is going to be an exchangeable matrix. It could be just an identity, which means that it actually isn't a function of alpha. It's just a, a diagonal ones. Uh, it could be the autocorrelation or other ones that, that seem to be prudent in modeling the dependencies across the random variables of interest. So this ends this uh, session of the lecture on generalized linear models.